Choice Theory and Reality Therapy. That's uh, Bill Glasser up there who uh, was the pioneer who developed choice theory uh, and the reality therapy that emerged from it. And clearly there's going to be some focus on making choices. But before we talk much about the theory, I'd like to have you reflect for a minute. So you might have a piece of scratch paper there. And actually, I hope you've got some paper to jot some notes down when you watch all these videos. Uh, but I'm going to ask you some specific questions and kind of rate how you think or how you feel about each of these items, kind of on a scale from, I don't know, 1 to 10, 10 being I totally agree with that, 1 being I totally disagree with that, and just kind of hold these in mind. So first of all, how much would you say you agree that everything human beings do is motivated by core inner needs? Do you agree with that, that people, everything people do is motivated by an attempt to meet or fill some needs? about the idea that behavior is completely within a person's control. Can you control all of your behavior? What about the idea that thoughts are completely within our control? And you could probably see this coming. How about feelings? Is the way we feel completely under our control? To what degree do you think so? And then finally, how much do you think that our physiology, our physical well-being and how our bodies are functioning, how much of that is a product of our choice? Sticking with our focus on choices, to what degree do you think that people choose their, their world, their circumstances, their experiences, including their misery? Do people choose to be miserable? Do people choose to be happy? Or are misery and happiness things that happen to people regardless of their choices. Where on that continuum do you find yourselves? All right, so these are some of the things that we're going to explore and address as we move through choice theory, reality therapy. And it's good to kind of keep in mind, where do you fit into this? How are your own beliefs and values uh, related to some of the ideas, the core concepts in this theory. First core concept I want to discuss is Glasser's idea that all human beings are motivated by five universal needs. Uh, everyone has these and they drive a lot of what we do in the world. Glasser might even say we can trace everything that we do back to, to trying to meet one of these five needs. First is basic survival. Do we have food, water, shelter, clothing, the things that we need to, to survive? Second is power and achievement. Not so much power as in, haha, I'm over you, but power uh, in the sense of, can I contribute in a meaningful way to the world? Do I have some influence in the world? Can I achieve meaningful things? Third one is freedom or independence. The idea that, that I'm not controlled by others People strive towards being able to choose their own destiny, to have a, an influence and a say in what happens to them and where they go in the world. Fourth, fun. This is a need to laugh, to relax, to play. Uh, and I like that he includes that. When you hear or see lists of basic human needs, uh, you often don't see one that's tied to fun or, or enjoyment of the world the way that one is. So I like that that's there. And then five, love and belonging. And Glasser said this is probably the most important one. We have a need to be connected to others, to feel like we belong, that we matter. And you've probably seen this in some ways in many of the theories that we've discussed. But Glasser really identifies that as a core human need. And, and among those five, perhaps the one that's most related, he would say, to the things that 
uh, bring clients in for counseling. So based on that, our, our health or our well-being as a person is to some extent dependent on our ability to effectively meet those needs with appropriate strategies. If I meet those needs by stealing and burning and pillaging and being a pirate, uh, we probably wouldn't call that health. But if I have healthy strategies to appropriately meet those needs, then I'm probably doing pretty good, according to Glasser. The next thing we need to understand is Glasser's concept of a quality world. He suggests that we all have one, but we may not really be aware of what's in it. And our quality world is the way we would like to meet those basic needs. So it includes all the people, activities, uh, objects, possessions, places, anything that we would like to use or to have involved in how we meet those five universal needs. So I'd love to have you take a second and start jotting down what are some of the things that fit in your quality world. And a good way to do this is to list out those five basic needs and then next to each one list the people, the places, the objects, the elements, the activities, anything that you would like to have as part of how you meet that particular need. And that will constitute your quality world. So pause the video, take a few seconds to jot some things down, and uh, bring those with you to class tomorrow. I have to say, as I think about my quality world and uh, our class tomorrow, two, two elements that seem really important to, to me meeting my needs tomorrow involve uh, flannel and burritos. I don't know about you guys. So the things that we do to try and achieve our quality world make up our total behavior. It's the, the sum or the aggregate of all the strategies that we use to reach our quality world. Glasser said that involves our choices in four areas. So total behavior includes what we choose to do in each of these four things. And the, the common metaphor used to describe this or explain it is a car. So we've got a little Lego car there. And the four wheels end up being these four components of total behavior. So the first are our actions. Glasser would say we choose what to do, and the things that we choose to do are attempts to create our quality world as we strive to meet those five basic needs. So our actions. The other one is our thoughts. We, the way we think is part of our total behavior how we're trying to reach that quality world. Now you'll notice that, that thoughts and actions are the front wheels on this car. We could say maybe that the engine is our uh, quality world. That's our, our goal state, where we're trying to get uh, motivated by trying to meet those, those five basic needs. So the five basic needs, that's our destination in the journey, our quality world, the way we want to do that, that's what's motivating what we're doing. And so the four wheels are what's going to carry us to get us there. Now the, the thoughts and the actions, they're the front wheels, so this is a front wheel drive car. So those are the things that we typically have the most control or the most choice over. We can choose our actions, we can choose our thoughts. Now he would say that the other two wheels are influenced by those choices, kind of like how the back two tires of a front wheel drive car, uh, they follow along where the front wheels go. We don't necessarily choose them specifically, but because they're, they're pulled along by those other two wheels, they are influenced very strongly by our choices. And those elements are our feelings. So how we think and how we act is going to pull our feelings along. And then he would say even our physiology, our, our, our bodily states are determined, he would say, in large part by how we choose to think and behave in the world. So total behavior, uh, the way we choose to think, to, to behave, and then also the way our choices influence our feelings and our physiology. So how do these uh, core components fit together into the different areas of the theory that we want to make sure we understand? Well, for thinking, the idea is that client concerns are produced by unhealthy, unsuccessful uses of our choices and our total behavior to try and achieve our quality world. And Glasser was really clear that, that he thought that it's that lack of a satisfying relationship that is really key. When we, when we don't have that core basic need met, that that produces all sorts of problems, that we end up 
trying to employ all sorts of unhealthy strategies to meet that need. So all those needs are important, but again, that, that relationship is really significant. A good way to think about this using our, our car metaphor is that when our total behavior, particularly our, our thoughts and our, our actions, our behaviors aren't pulling us in the right direction, we can get ourselves into all sorts of problems. Okay, so if unhealthy use of total behavior is what causes problems, then it stands to reason that client change will require better use of total behavior. And this is going to involve the client recognizing the responsibility that they have for those four components of their total behavior, and then choosing to employ them in ways that will move them in a healthy way towards their quality world. So back to our metaphor, they need to learn some better driving skills, better ways to use particularly their thinking and their actions that will move them down the road to their quality world. Okay, so the doing part of this theory is based on the acronym WDEP. And that will guide how the counselor structures the sessions, works to, to collaborate with the client to figure out what are we going to do and how are we going to do it. And it starts with the W, wants. Uh, working together to identify what is it that the client wants in the world. Which of their needs are not getting met? Um, what's in this client's quality world? And how well are they able to to create their quality world. Then the doing, what is the client doing to try and achieve their quality world? How are they employing their total behavior to move towards meeting those basic uh, universal needs? And once we understand what they're doing, then we work together to evaluate that. How well is the, are the choices that the client is making helping them to achieve and create their quality world? What's, what's the results of their total behavior? And we do this by, by kind of gently challenging the client. Uh, if, if we did this in a really unhealthy, extreme way, it would look like what Dr. Phil does. How's that working for you? So there's some sense that that's what we're trying to help the client recognize and explore. How, how well is their total behavior moving them in the direction that they want to go? But the, the stress here is on doing it in a gentle, compassionate way that invites the client to be reflective rather than hitting them over the head with it. And then finally, the P part, once we understand what the client wants, what they're doing to try and achieve that, how well that's working or not working, then we work together to create a really collaborative plan that will help them to move uh, in a better direction. And let's take a look a little bit more at what, what that plan involves. Setting plans as part of that WDEP asks us to be pretty detailed and pretty specific, a little bit like that house plan there. You can't just randomly sketch out things. You've got to have all the details, the dimensions, and know what you're doing. So that acronym, SAMIC3, can guide it. Plans with clients need to be simple, attainable, something we can measure, something that the client can start doing immediately doesn't help to put it off, but what can you do differently tonight, tomorrow, right now? And then the client needs to, to do it consistently. Uh, it has to be something within the client's control and they have to commit to doing it. So when we can create a plan that incorporates all of these characteristics, then we're helping a client move towards their, their uh, quality world in a healthy way. In the being part of this theory, um, the client-counselor relationship is very important. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that it's, it's through that relationship that the client's going to be able to recognize maybe some problems with their total behavior and that they'll, they'll gain some of the motivation and energy that they need to be able to make changes to the things that they're doing. The counselor takes the role of kind of a coach or a teacher and that includes a couple of different elements. First we want to accept the client as the client is. We're not here to change the client. We want to accept them, provide that unconditional positive regard and warmth, um, and that doing that will help build trust between the client and the counselor. Next, we're, the, the counselor is very supportive and encouraging. Again, not cheerleading, not feeding cotton candy, but helping the client realize that there's hope that things can get better, that they can meet all their needs in healthy ways. There's a real focus on the present and maybe a little bit of the near future. Uh, we don't spend too much time focusing on the past. It's really figuring out what are you doing right now? 
What do you want right now? What can you change right now and in the very near future that will help move you the direction you want to go? There's the uh, a persistence with that WDEP model. The client may try to go some different directions, but the counselor really stays pretty firm with trying to assess what are the wants, what's the client doing, how well is that helping the client, and what specific concrete plans can we help commit the client to that will move them towards change. So there's, there's a kindly but a almost doggedly persistence uh, in following that model. Now the counselor stays enthusiastic. And, and again, that doesn't look like cheerleading, but this real sense of, of hopeful encouragement. And then finally, uh, the client and the counselor stay focused on what's within this client's sphere of control. And a lot of times the, the client will want to talk about things that they can't control. So the counselor's job is to really help them come back to what is it that you can make changes in? What are the things that you can choose? Which comes back to the four components of the total behavior. So that little diagram there, you see that, that there's this sphere of control which really involves just ourselves. I can control myself. So I shouldn't be focusing on things that are outside of my sphere of control. Some things that we can influence are the people around us, but the only way we can influence those, those people and the environment right around us is by focusing on the things that we can control ourselves. And this is a nice kind of model. You'll see this come out in some other approaches, um, particularly in some, some addictions counseling. This tends to be a model that gets used, not reality therapy so much, but this notion of a sphere of control, sphere of influence, and things that are outside of our control and influence. Here's some things I want you to think about uh, in review. Again, jot some of these ideas down and, and bring them to class. It might be helpful for you. So consider how, how would you summarize this theory in one sentence? And as you summarize it, try to capture um, how this theory explains client problems and what it says uh, the client and the counselor need to do in order to resolve them. How can you use the things that we've talked about and the things that you've read about to help capture, oh, here's what this theory says causes and is needed to resolve client concerns. So take a second and jot some things down about that. If you need to, pause the video, or you can see, I'm going to say one more thing, and you can do it after that. But jot some things down, bring them into class. It'll help us in our conversation. It'll help as well as you write the, the brief for this theory. The next one, kind of related, is how can you apply all this to OPI? And when we're going to apply a theory to a case, again, we call that case conceptualization, and we want to identify what's, what might be going on using this theory that's causing OPI's concerns. How can we explain what's going on with OPI using this theory? So it's kind of blending the story, the vignette, and the elements from the theory together. And then what does this theory say that uh, OP needs to do and that the counselor needs to do with OP to help OP experience some changes that will be helpful for him? So jot some thoughts down related to those things and bring them. That'll help prep us for our role play. It'll help prep you for writing the brief as well. All right, we'll see you tomorrow.